Welcome to Finished Work International Ministries, a ministry that is on the cutting edge, changing lives around the world. As you let God in today and apply the word, expect a divine encounter and supernatural transformation. It is impossible for you to be defeated when you have the revelation of the will of God. It is impossible for situations to subdue you when you walk in understanding of what God is saying to you. Let the finished work of Jesus determine what you pray. When God is your source, you don't look back. You keep looking forward. You keep trusting. Him. God, I trust you. Here's Apostle Faith Man Obuena. And failure is directly related to family habits. The habits that people pick in family can determine their future, except they alter that habit with God's word if the habit is not consistent with the word of God. The nature of any family, or we can use the word the structure of any family can determine the potential and the future of that family. So if this family is not rooted in biblical foundation, this family cannot produce the God kind of results. Every family on the face of the earth is a family on assignment. Every family on earth is a family on assignment. There's an assignment on the life of your family. There is something that God has created your family to accomplish. So a family is seen as God's team for God's purpose. I want to say that again. A family is seen as God's team for God's purpose. A family is a team. And this is why we need to understand that our success is not tied to it isolating those that God has connected us with. When, when God connects you with a wife, you know, or with a husband, and one thing I want to say this to you, you can't get 100% in anybody. And if you truly want to remain in any relationship, your pursuit should be on their strength. Your focus should be on the strength of the one you're relating with. But sometimes a lot of people focus on the weakness and they measure on the weakness until they lose focus of the strength of the relationship. You see, God has called us to relate, and it takes the knowledge of his word for we to be effective in our relationship. It takes the knowledge of his word for you to be effective in any relationship. If you don't have the knowledge of his word, you cannot be effective and fruitful in any relationship. So the, the first thing we need to consider is that God gives us family for a purpose. And God puts us in a family for a purpose. God gives us family for a purpose. And God puts us in a family for a purpose. You know, how is your family connected to your purpose? You know, in Africa, we have a proverb that said, if you fight outside and come into the house, you'll be protected. But if you fight right in the house, you have no one to protect you. If you fight in the street and you run back to the house, you run back to your home, you'll be protected. But when you fight in your home, you have no place of security. You have no place of protection. So a family was given to us for the purpose of synergy. You know, God puts you in a family for the purpose of synergy, for the purpose of a teamwork. We work better when we're two. We work better when we're three. When you see three people reasoning together, they are going to have a better result. 
So the life of a relationship is a one principle called honor. The life of a relationship or a family is in one principle called honor. Now, when people fail to honor each other, it becomes difficult for them to tap into each other's potential. When we fail to honor each other, now sometimes you don't honor people because they've got everything right. You know, if, if you want to honor people because they get everything right, it will be difficult for you to relate with anyone. And the principle of honor suggests commitment. It's so that we, we, we may disagree in family, but we are not expected to break up in family. And it takes a lot of tolerance for we to stay in family. You know, Jesus said, you know, the scripture talk about that Jesus could not do mighty works there. It's the place where they know him. Family members are involved. <laughs> they can tolerate you. Oh, look at you. I know you. <laughs> Why are you trying to say that? What do you think you can do? There is always the, the tendency of familiarity in family. Especially people that wake up and they see you and you see them. They wake up in the morning, they greet you good morning sometimes. Sometimes they don't greet you good morning because you're offended from last night's event. So it, it takes a lot of honor to stay in relationship. And you know, some of us, some people may say, but Apostle, I've done my best to be in this relationship. We're going to talk about toxic relationship among family members. There are difficult family members. There are difficult wives. There are difficult husbands. There are wives that are difficult. Oh, oh, yes, yes, Jesus, hallelujah. Glory be to God. There are difficult wives. <laughs> and there are also difficult husbands. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do, <laughs> they are not satisfied. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how the meal is prepared, they don't like it. <laughs> no matter what you do, you put up a hair and thinking he's going to like your new hairstyle, he didn't see it. Now, I don't want that to bother you. Whether your hairstyle was recognized or not, don't bother about this. I believe there are things we can decide not to look at and have a beautiful relationship. Some people are not good in appreciating what you put on. Yes. Yes. I said yes. And we can pick fight from there. Sometimes the fight begins with our hair. You, you didn't see my hair today. You didn't see how this hair look on me. And then you have started a fight. Maybe he wasn't thinking about that. Maybe he was thinking about the debts, the bills, and the situations around the family. So there are things you would ignore to have a better relationship. You are not expected to look out for every wrong thing that goes on in your marriage. And every time you point them out. And the more you do that, the tendency for the relationship to always have crisis. There are marriages where people are always in crisis. And I believe that if you're gonna stay married, you must be willing to tolerate a lot. Marriage is for people that have tolerance. I used to say to people, if you can't tolerate, don't marry. There's a lot of tolerance, you know, you have to do. There are a lot of things you have to do, not because you like it, but because you felt that my team member may not be perfect in this area, but I'm going to tap in the energy, where he has energy, where he has ability. I'm going to focus on that area because sometimes marriage is split on issues that ought not to be issued. 
93% of the time that you have divorce issues are matters that we could actually handle it. But just that we are not emotionally prepared to go through the process and then we say, man, I'm done with this and we're gone. And maybe we'll go back to another relationship, maybe we'll get into another relationship only to find that, that the person we're hooking up with right now is worse than where we're coming from. I've seen people in that kind of situation. They thought, oh my God, I thought I was done with this. No, you are not done with it because people take time to grow. And now we're surprised. I thought it was going to be gentle all through. The things you don't see at this side, you may see it at the other side. And that is why sometimes I encourage people to try to work on something, even when it's challenging. I can't tell you that all the marriages are, are beautiful, they are perfect. There are challenges people go through. Challenge, challenge of communication. The challenge of communication. There are people when they're offended, they expect you to be depressed. That's the only way you can please them. There are people when they are broke, they expect you to give them everything. And if you don't give them, they are mad at you. There are all kinds of attitude that comes up in people's life. And this is why the first step to help the relationship is God's word. I want to say that again. I said the first step to a healthy relationship is God's word. The tendency for people who have God's word to be gentle, to be teachable, is always there than an individual that have no room for the word of God. So the first thing we're going to look at today is that family is the will of God. God likes family. God likes family. And someone said, what about if it's not perfect? Well, the perfection of family comes through process. It comes through process. The perfection of family comes through process. There were things I never understood when I got married early. And then when I understood it, I didn't have a problem anymore. There are things I don't want to say anything about it. Especially if it's not something that is that important and relevant. There are certain matters you allow people to make decisions. You know why? You allow them to make decisions to be dead in the relationship. Our job is not to clone our spouse. You have to talk like me. You have to be like me. Can't you see the way I'm doing it? No, they can't be like you. You are you. The beauty of the relationship is that we're two different people living together. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The beauty of the relationship is that we are two personalities living together. We are two personalities living together. We come from different backgrounds. So the will of God is family. The will of God is family. So what are the key things we need to look at if this family is going to be strong? And one of the things I taught us a few minutes ago is the principle of honor. You don't honor people because they are perfect. You honor them because that's the right thing to do. And honor does not suggest that you cannot speak your mind. Honor does not suggest that you cannot bring correction if there is a need for correction. Honor just does not suggest that you cannot uh, bring direction or make right decisions. Say, well, this way we're going is wrong. Can't we go this way? Because you should be in a relationship where you have an opportunity to say something. You shouldn't be in a relationship where you can't say something. Because your relationship and the life of it is communication. Communication is one of the vitamins of relationship. I said communication is one of the vitamins or the vitamin of relationship. The life of relationship actually drives in communication. This is why major crisis starts when there is a breakdown of communication. Major crisis starts. And we have to work hard to stay in the place of communication. We have to work hard to stay in the place of communication. Do you know you can be in this room or you can be in a room and your spark can't reach you because either you're too busy with your phone or you're very busy with something from your place of work. It's good to work, but it's also good to make time for family life. There are many Christians with a very poor sex life. Very poor sex life. 
very poor sex life. And most times the issue of divorce begins from there. Very poor sex life. Many years ago, I had a, this guy in our local church. It, the wife came to me, said, Apostle, I want to divorce my husband. I, uh, uh, so uh, I talked to my wife. I said, can you talk to her to ask her some questions? Questions like, what is the condition of your sex life? Do you have a good sex life? Well, I've said, no, I can't ask her that kind of question. I said, bring her to my office. I will ask her. I'm waiting. I will ask her. I will ask her. That's from the pastor. The pastor will ask all the questions. So she came and said, oh, oh, when will last give people have sex? Oh, no, 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 no. Apostle, we don't talk about that, please. For a long time, we're done with that. We're done with that. I said, can I give you an, uh, can I give you an insight? Can I share a principle with you? Uh, let's try something. If it works, it will be okay. Uh, can you have sex with your husband for the next two weeks? Consistently sex for two weeks. He said, well, 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 I don't think, you know, well, okay, let me, let me try it. I said, try it. When you've done it for two weeks, come back and tell me you want to divorce. She came back and said, no, I don't want to divorce. Oh, first I was, I was like, I can't divorce. He's a good man. Did you see what happened? Now you think I was not a Holy Ghost pastor. You think I'm not a Holy Ghost pastor, but I'm restoring marriages. <laughs> I'm bringing healing to people's home. <laughs> I didn't pray about it. I didn't pray about it. You know, Sometimes when something is missing, we we'll fight. But we don't fight with understanding. You know, sometimes people communicate differently. And if you're here today, I pray that God will give you this understanding to see need, what the need is, and what the situation is. Families were set up for the purpose of enjoying each other, especially marriage. And when we're in the marriage relationship and we're not enjoying each other, that should give us concern. You know, some people think that, well, I don't like my wife so much, or maybe she's putting on weight. Or if your wife is putting on weight, you have gene all over the country. Go to gene together. Escort her to gene. I've been trying to make my wife run for a long time. I haven't been able to achieve it. I've been trying all my best. Tell my wife, you're going to run. Say, yes, I'm going to run. <laughs> and I've been patient. Wait, can you just do some exercise? So one day I saw her running. I said, oh, Jesus has visited our house. Glory to God. And since then, it's six months. <laughs> we are believing God for that area of exercise. <laughs> so, so you have to get to a point where you, you're willing to stick with your spouse until you see the change you're looking for. There are people who are not exercise driven. There are people who they, they don't like going out. There are all kinds of people. So you, you got to know who you're dealing with. Our cases are different. And this is what, why what works in one relationship may not work in the next relationship. But what I'm trying to do with this teaching is to give you an insight to be able to study who you're keeping company with. Who is your friend? Who is your wife? Who you're relating with? What is their need? Sometimes you need to go ask them, what is your major need? What is it you think that if I do it right now, this marriage is going to work out? Oh, you want to hear from me? Oh, I've been waiting for you to tell, ask me this question. I've been, oh, maybe your pastor told you in church to come and ask me. Let me tell you, sit down here. Let me explain to you for the past seven years I've been waiting for this question. <laughs> but you see, you, you are loosening some things up. I just pray that the Holy Ghost will give you some insight. So, so you walk up to him. Maybe this man has been very difficult. You have tried to fight, it didn't work out. You tried to quarrel, it didn't work out. You tried to keep malice, it didn't work out. You, you, you tried to sleep in the other room and he sleep in the other room, it didn't work out. Okay, but after the service, you walk up to him and said, 
Oh, glory be to God. You know you're a very handsome man. He hasn't heard that for one year. Then they said, this is suspicious. <laughs> Can you tell me your major challenge? What is your problem? You know, sometimes when we ask those kind of questions, people have the tendency to pour out their heart to us. But you see, when you always take it at the point of battle, you won't be able to get what you're looking for. The same thing to your wife. Your wife has not been giving you attention that you want. The things have not really been working out with both of you. You just say, is there anything that I'm doing that is not helping this marriage? Is there anything I'm doing that is not helping this marriage? You see, we should be there for each other. And it takes wisdom to be there for each other. If it is hurting her, I have to stop it. If it is giving her pain, I have to stop it. Why? Because I want to save the relationship. Family is the will of God. It takes honor and communication to keep it. I said family is the will of God. It takes honor and communication to keep it. It takes honor and communication. Can I say this to you? When you honor a person, the tendency for them to share more of themselves to you is there. When you honor a person. And honor can be found in your tune, in your speech. You know, most of us, some people can talk with a rude attitude. Oh my God. Majority of the time there is a fight at home, physical violent fight, it started with tune, the way I said it, the way she said it. And then there is a fight, a serious fight. And for that reason, you know, one of the keys to keeping a relationship going is to learn to be quiet while the other person is talking. Especially if it's coming with a tune that offends you and makes you feel bad, just try as much as you can to be quiet. If possible, you can just leave the environment. What is the purpose of that? Because if both of you go into this clash, there's going to be crisis. That your quiet doesn't mean you're weak. I want to say this again. I said that your quiet doesn't mean you're weak. Your quiet can be a sign of trying to manage the situation. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, it can be a big sign of trying to manage the situation. A big sign of trying to manage the situation. A pastor came to me several years, maybe like, like five years ago. Five to six years ago, he told me he wants to divorce his wife. That he was tired of everything that the wife is trying to impose so many things on him, trying to control him. And both of them were pastors many years ago before they came and married, they mar before they married together. So I said, before you divorce her, can, can I talk with your wife? He said, yes, I can tell her that you want to see her. So I invited the wife to my house and I started talking to her. Did you know it is seven years? These people have been having a beautiful relationship, but they have not called me back. They are happy. I'm not mad that they didn't call me back. No, no, no. But I see them all over the Facebook, everywhere. They are together. They are doing things together. They are happy. But they didn't call me back and say, Apostle, thank you that you helped us to fix this thing. It was something very little. I just told the woman to do. And that was it. The marriage was saved. The guy is happy. So, Conflict in relationship cannot be avoided, but can be managed. That is hard. See? 
there'll be a tendency for someone to say something and you want to say something and if you're not careful you you the way you said it the whole place is in crisis so when there is a tendency of conflict you can manage your emotion and say to yourself not now and maybe after 15 minutes you will notice that your spouse is relaxed and you can open up another conversation. And then you notice things that are moving again. But do you know from that little conflict, it can generate into a major problems. Most of the divorce cases and crisis, they are just little issues. They are issues when you hear it, you'll be surprised. You know, like the one I heard, a guy just got married to a lady, and this guy likes sugar. So the lady doesn't like sugar. He said, please, can I have one sugar? The lady said, no, you can have sugar. I don't want you to have sugar. No, please, give me a light sugar. I want, to, I want to have one sugar. The lady said, no. The guy said, please, give me one. He said, no. So he tries to take it. There was a fact. Just one cube of sugar. For me, if you like sugar, I'll buy you a packet. If sugar will give you peace, take the sugar. Hallelujah. Take the sugar. Or maybe later I will, I will, I will talk to you about why sugar is not good for you. Why it's not good for you. But you see, sometimes we want to try to show people that will have authority, will know something about the situation, and then will fight has come up. A lot of fights can be avoided when we will choose the path of peace. A lot of fights can be avoided. When we choose the path of peace, a lot of fights can be avoided. There are certain things you can say, well, that shouldn't be a problem. I shouldn't give much of my time to it. I shouldn't put my energy into it. So conflict is real, but we can manage that conflict that it, can, it shouldn't spread to a point that it begins to affect our marriage and then our children. And children can easily know when things are going wrong. Trust me. They can know when things are going wrong. They can know when things are going on. One of the greatest things we can do for our children is to keep a healthy relationship. Why? They need it for their emotional strength. They need it for their emotional strength. Why did I say that? Because there are children that a breakup affected their life. Divorce ruined their life. Yes. They couldn't stand their dad and their mom splitting. So sometimes we need to fight to keep our relationship, especially when what is going on in that relationship is, God is saying, watch over this. Be patient with this. Be patient with that. This is why you need to hear from God. Be patient with this. Be patient with that. And if God is telling you to be patient with it, that means he has a plan for it. And we don't go ahead of God because of anger. And one of the things you need to watch out for is anger. Because when you're angry, you make wrong decisions. 93% of decisions made in anger were not best of decisions. 93% of decisions made in anger. You're angry and you drove your car, you left the house. Someone was angry that way. Had a fight with a wife. And the guy drove out of the house, and while he was driving out, he knocked up a child on the roadside. Look at what anger has done. More problem has come. So when you are angry, try to manage your emotion to a point where you are you're, you're not willing to do something that will hurt you. Because sometimes when we're angry as men and women, if you're not able to manage your emotion from God's word, you can start doing things you're not supposed to do. Anger is one of the reasons why people get into adultery. They were angry. So, okay, let me go and hang out with this woman here. 
And then in their anger, they are hurting themselves. It happens to men, it happens to women. I was talking to a lady that just came newly to our local church. So she's in this marriage, but she doesn't like the man. So I told her, why don't you like the man? She said, the man abused her so much. So she started seeing another man, having relationship with another man. And I said, why are you having relationship with that other man? Is it because he gives me money? I said, money? I said, don't you think this is going to have effect on your life and the things you do? He said, she doesn't really care about that. That the man have hurted her to a point that she's willing to do anything. Then I saw where offense lead people into extramarital affairs. Offense. If you can't manage offense, you can't secure your relationship. Offense will come. If I sit down here and tell you that you are not going to be offended, I'm just lying to you. But in offense, don't forget your values. Don't forget this word. In offense, don't forget your values. Don't betray your values because you're offended. Don't betray your values. Because, your friend, because offense have the tendency to make you walk away from your values. Either you're trying to prove something. I, I want to tell him that I can do what he think I cannot do. And before I realize, we started with one relationship extra from our home. The second one, the third one, that's how people get into trouble. It starts with unmanaged offense, unmanaged anger. You, you are not able to manage that anger. That offense, and if that person couldn't manage the anger, he couldn't manage the offense, it leads them into situations that can ruin their life. A healthy relationship is built on the principle of love and understanding. A healthy relationship is built on the principle of love and understanding. Love and understanding. See, understanding a person takes time. It takes time too. You, you can marry someone for 20 years and then find out something about them and they say, wow, I never knew you have this issue. When you find it out, believe God to handle it. Hallelujah. I said, when you find it out, I said what? Believe God to handle it. Believe God to handle it. So you, it's, it's built on understanding. Let's look at the scripture today. In Proverbs chapter 4. Hallelujah. In Proverbs chapter 4. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're going to have beautiful families at the end of this series. Our families are going to be strong. Our families are going to be wonderful because there are things that will show up. You know what to do about it. You just say, okay, 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 I, I get you now. Okay. In Proverbs chapter 4, I like us to look at verse 7. It said, wisdom is the principal thing. What is the principal thing? Wisdom is the principal thing. And, and this is the, the, the key to building healthy marriage. Wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom to hear the cry of your spouse. Wisdom to honor your spouse. You know, there are some people that can ask you question, and the way they ask you the question, anger came out of you. Have you been in that situation before? Someone is asking you a question, but the question is provoking. Not that the question was wrong, but the way they asked the question. You know, some people don't know how to talk. <laughs> Take it from me. It's not that 
the question was wrong. It was the way the question was presented. And then instead of you answering the question, you fought them. <laughs> Glory to God. You, you fought them. You, you are angry. Why would you ask me that kind of question? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, well, you, are, you are taking it to the... <laughs> Are you blind? Can't you see? <laughs> you are, now, issues are coming up right now. It's just a question. But the question wasn't asked right. There is how you ask the question, you have generated conflict. Problem have started. It's just a question. And this is what is, were you the one that took the the, the pen out of my locker or out of my table, were you the one? No, I was not the one. I know you are the one that took that pen. I know. How did you know? How did you know? And he said, you have started again. <laughs> you have started again. It's not, I didn't take the pen. Crisis. Because we we'll never ask the question the way it should be. I think it takes wisdom to ask the right question with the right tone. Please, can I? The, the, the way you keep your voice. Even the person you're talking to, if he's a devil, he will listen. Did you hear what I said? Even if he's a devil, he will listen. The way you, you, you place your voice to, the, the person wants to talk to you. He wants to respond. So the scripture said here in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, he said, wisdom is the principal thing. Because in wisdom, you question will produce opportunity for conversation in wisdom. Your question will produce opportunity for conversation. But if there is no wisdom and you ask question without the wisdom in it, there's going to be conflict. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. He said that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all you're getting. Get understanding. Remember the issue of David. <laughs> wow. There was so much wisdom needed to manage his family. And there were so many issues and crises that showed up in the house of David. David was a man of God, but there were some major issues about his relationship with his family. And you see, with wisdom, we can avoid some situations. I said, with wisdom, we can do what? We can avoid some situations. There are situations we can avoid because we have the wisdom of God. There are situations we can avoid. And, and there is one thing the Holy Ghost is saying to us today is that you need wisdom to enjoy relationship. You need wisdom to enjoy people. You need wisdom to enjoy those that God has put in your life. And without the wisdom of God, you cannot enjoy the relationship. Without the wisdom of God, you cannot enjoy the relationship. You know, as a pastor, I meet with all kinds of difficult people. Also, one thing I've come to learn is Uh, wisdom shows you your boundary in that relationship. This, this, this is the boundary. This, this is the boundary. And because you have wisdom, you are not in a hurry to pour out your heart. You know, 
especially in the media age that we found ourselves. There are all kinds of marriages breaking. Do you know that someone can do a photo shoot with your face? With your face and put another man's face and it look like you're kissing. You know, there are things like that. Now, if the woman is not secure, maybe a female did that to the husband and just remove, put his head with someone who was kissing a woman and just frame that up. Oh, this man, I know something was going on. Be led by the spirit before you start giving attention to such pictures. People can set up your marriage. Yes. Yes, I'm telling you. And the more successful you are, the more careful you have to be. Because there are people who want to make out issues out of your life. Hallelujah. You know, they are talking about a particular singer. They said he was abusing women. I asked this question. What was the women looking for in his house? Is it no money they were looking for? That was, yeah. I used to ask very practical questions. Most of them were looking for him. They were looking for money. He has money. People get what they look for. And this is why you need wisdom to know what to do when things are not going right. One manifestation of the wisdom of God can heal your marriage. I'm telling you, the marriage may be so bad right now that you don't want to see this woman, you don't want to see this man, but the wisdom of God brings healing. Maybe there is something you are addicted to. There is something you are struggling with. He said, Lord, give me wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom to manage things. Wisdom to handle things. Lord, give me. You pray for that. You pray. Because I see God restoring marriages in this series. I see God healing Marriage is healing homes. And if you're here today, your marriage is going through a problem, I trust God to restore it completely in the name of Jesus. I trust him to restore it. To restore it and, and bring healing to your home. And the recovery begins with you. And the attitude you have as a person that your spouse is always complaining about. Why not just pay attention and ask yourself a question? How does this attitude help my marriage? Maybe you always come back late and you come from work, instead of going home, you hang out with your friends and you spend three hours, you spend four hours, and then you come home, your wife said, I've been waiting for you. I've made the food. Why didn't you come early? Then you notice that is not good. I have to stop that. You work hard. If you're giving your friends four hours, try giving them 10 minutes this week and run back to your house, run back to your home. That way you can begin to restore. Maybe the man is tired of how you bring your family matters into his house. He doesn't like hearing much about it. People are different. There are those who can accommodate some things, and there are people who can accommodate what you're trying to tell them. So what am I trying to say? Know what your spouse can accommodate. And the things they can accommodate, keep it far from them. The reason for that is, it's going to help your marriage. He doesn't like hearing about the crisis you're having with your family members. He doesn't want to hear about that. So... You just keep it to yourself and pray to God to heal it. Because whenever you bring up the matter, she doesn't want to hear it or he doesn't want to hear it. And there's a crisis all over the place. No. You 
begin to trust God to heal that aspect. We can manage conflicts. We can decide to bring it to, to a point, to a, a zero point where our marriages and our relationship is less conflict. We're like, we don't have issues much because we have decided to learn how to manage our emotion, manage what we are to say and what we are not to say. It goes a long way to help us. It goes a long way to help us. So when it comes to your marriage, your marriage, see yourself as a team that have a vision. Your marriage must have a vision. What are we going to achieve? What are we doing with our life? We have come together to build together. We're supposed to be be encouraging one another. And learning to speak words of encouragement gives life to your relationship. Imagine you wake up tomorrow morning and you tell your wife, today is going to be your best day of your life. Oh, thank you. Or you tell your husband, honey, today is going to be the best day of your life. When did you start saying all of this? Maybe it's not somebody who like to receive those kind of words. So thank you. You know, there, there is how someone tell you thank you. No, they're not interested. But, but that shouldn't bother you. You're, you're building it. Hallelujah. You're building it. You know, I'm talking to all kinds of people with all kinds of relationship. So you say, oh, you're, you're looking good today. Well, well, I, I, do you think that? Do you think that? Okay, thank you. But there are people who tell them they're looking good. Oh, thank you. Oh, what a lovely gift you've given to me this morning. Everyone is not at the same level of gratitude. Everyone is not at the same level of gratitude. Everyone is not at the same level of gratitude. Some people respond more to gratitude while others don't respond more to, don't respond so much, don't respond well to gratitude. So what am I trying to say? Now, when you wake up tomorrow, this week, try to say something encouraging. Try to say something that will, will bring words of hope. Just plant the seed. Just, just bring the encouragement. You say, no, Apostle, I, I can't bring the encouragement. I'm tired of this man. Let him go. I'm tired. Of, okay. Be, be, before you said you're tired for the first time, let, let's just do this. Give some encouragement. Believe God, no, no matter how bad it is. It may be so bad that you say, Apostle, if I tell you my story, you can't believe me. I can't believe you. But what I'm trying to say, can we give it another chance? Can you give your wife another chance? Can you give your husband another chance? Can you just look at the whole thing and say, remember when you got married 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago? Two years ago, six months ago, you were in love. You are in love, really. You didn't see the problems. Now we're trying to fix the problems. (laughs) That's what we're trying to do right now. (laughs) You know, love covered multitude of sin. When we're in love, there are things you don't see. But thank God for Jesus who loved us and fixed us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus who loved us and fixed us. So that's the essence of this teaching. That you'll be able to speak hope. You'll be able to speak life. You'll be able to speak strength. You'll be able to speak encouragement. You know, you'll be able to say to yourself, well, we can do this. We, we can do this. You know, there are things we never expected that was going to happen, but it happened. But like, we can do this. And you speak encouragement to yourself. I think you need to be at the point of encouragement to bring encouragement. Now, before I round up, let me say this in closing. I'm about to close, but let me say this. When work hard to keep your bond with your wife, or with your husband, work hard. Because there are external people, external factors 
that can affect this relationship. You know, I was preaching somewhere many years ago. A lot of people, when they get married and they start having children, they transfer all their attention to their children. They give all their attention to their children, all, all. So they don't have time for their husband. So when they are getting old, what the danger of it is that your son will soon get married, your daughter will soon get married, and you will stick with this, your wife. You are going to stay with this, your wife. Everybody will be getting married and they'll be going to their own house. And you'll be left with your wife. If your son is one year old or six months old, just calculate the next 24 years. <laughs> your son will be getting married. 24 years is not far from today. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. If your daughter is five years old, add 20 years to each. She'll be getting married soon. Amen. That's for we that are still having little children. Amen. Now, you notice that when these people are going, you are left alone. <laughs> Back to where you started from. God help you that if you have not built a good relationship with your husband or with your wife, the marriage becomes bored. This is why people divorce at 60. You ask why? They have been married all of this year. They have been married for 40 years. They have been married for 35 years. No, yes, they were married, but they had no attention for each other. So the, the focus of the attention is gone. Their son is gone. Their daughter is gone. They're by themselves. And they're not used to being by themselves. They will have a fight. Issues will come up. Oh, I wish my son was here now. He could have fixed this. Oh, I wish my daughter was here now. She could have fixed this. I'm tired. I want to travel to go and stay with my daughter. In Africa, they do that. <laughs> you see, the woman travel for six months. And the, the man is alone. Then a few months later, you hear that the man is dead. Because there was no unity. Attend to your marriage. Love your children. But don't give the time you have to give to your wife, to your children, and neglect your wife. Or the time you have to give to your husband, you give it to your children. Learn to manage your time properly as you can enjoy your marriage as you grow older. This is a wise counsel for everyone that is here. This is a wise counsel. <laughs> You didn't ask me, Apostle, how did you come up with all these concepts? You know, I'm always making research because I want to live long. How many of you are praying for me? <laughs> I want to live long. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm making discoveries why things don't work <laughs> and why they work. So I'm in search <laughs> of, of knowing what works and what does not work. Hallelujah. My son is uh, over 16, and he will go and marry my daughter, the same thing. So I, I have to attend to my wife. We need to build our bond. Why? Because all of those children, they will be on their own. And then if I don't have a good relationship with my wife now, I won't have a better home tomorrow. What am I saying this? This is wisdom for the future. This is wisdom for where you're going. And there are so many of us that we're, we're into our children, but we're not into our marriage. There are women that are that way. Telling you. They love their children more than their husband. If anything comes up, they will prefer to give to their children first before they consider their husband. <laughs> Is that, you know, I know. <laughs> and sometimes, if you're not careful in managing things that way, you may end up bringing strife to your home. And the same to some men. They, 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 they love their, their girl's daughter, they love their son more, they give more time to them, but not to their wife. You should be able to bring the balance as you can be able to secure your home 
and build a healthy relationship. You must have time for one another. At least for every married person here, at least try spending like two hours with your husband or with your wife every day. Two hours. Two hours is not much. But sometimes it's difficult for me to get two hours because the children are there, our job is there, our business is there, our parents are there, this is here, and sometimes we'll end up not talking to each other, not having intimacy, not relating. So I want you to begin to reconsider your plans, begin to plan your time properly. This week should be a beautiful week for all the married people here. Amen. That, uh, let your wife know that, hey, Apostle has spoken to you. And let your husband, oh, my wife has changed. This church she went on Sunday, God has helped her. Yes. And that is why when they said it, so you must learn to make time. Some people became sick because nobody was giving them attention. We started giving more attention to our career, to our business, to our friends, but not to the one we got married to. I noticed that when people are in their honeymoon, they are always together. When they are getting married, you know, I saw some young people in our local church, they're about to get married, they're happy, you know, I'm seeing them, so I pray this happiness will continue. Because people get married after two years, they're bored. They're bored. Where is your wife? She's there. Wow. Before, when you say, where is your wife? She's here. Before he's here, now you say, where is your wife? She's there. The momentum has dropped. The energy has dropped. The passion is no more there. there this, this Sunday should be a passion Sunday. <laughs> so that you put some energy into your marriage. Some energy into your home. And I believe, and you have to, every external person, you should be able to define to them the, the lines. Whether mother-in-law, father-in-law, sister-in-law, brother-in-law, father-in-law, step-in-law, new-in-laws, whichever law that tries to come in, we should be able to make them understand that this is the boundary. Now it's our family time. We are to stay together. We are to work together. You have to tell people what you want. And you have to make it clear to them. And that way you can build a healthy relationship. No matter, okay, ask in laws. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> so, well, whatever. <laughs> so, well, what are out in law, in or out? Whatever that is going on, let everybody mind their business. Hallelujah. So, let, let's, let's, let's just protect our homes and enjoy our homes. And I, I know someone is here today. That this Sunday reward your marriage. You haven't spoken to your husband for a long time. Pick the phone and said, uh, I love you. I, 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 I like you to I like us to talk. Amen. Let's rekindle some fire. Let's be more honest to one another. Let's let's be caring. Let's be loving. Let's be gentle. That your marriage will be an inspiration to our generation. No matter how devastated things may be right now, no matter how, uh, how scattered things may be right now, but this marriage can just come up again. Life can come into this marriage. We can love one another again. We can relate to one another again. And so, well, let's give it a chance. Hallelujah. And let's enjoy having intimacy. Hallelujah. Let's enjoy having intimacy. A lot of us are, oh, I'm fasting. Don't fast without telling your wife or your husband. Don't do that. You want to fast? Honey, I'm fasting this week. Your wife gets to know. Your husband gets to know. You don't just go into fast and lock up yourself and say, I don't want to talk to anybody. Please, I didn't send you to do that. We want to go into fast, talk to your wife. Let them have a knowledge that you're fasting. Praise the Lord. These are little things that could cause problems in our marriages. The man come and said, I want to talk, I want to touch you. Ah, no, no, no. Please. Can't you know I'm fasting? The spirit is here. You can't do this. <laughs> and then <laughs> they go out there and do it. <laughs> Save your marriage. <laughs> I'm on a mission this morning.
to restore, to heal, and to establish homes. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So I pray that the wisdom of God will come upon you as you can have a blissful relationship. You can have a wonderful relationship and your life will not remain the same. Let's just pray. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you this morning. I thank you because you have ministered to us. You have, you have given us direction. You have given us wisdom. We pray for every home that is here. We, we, we pray for every family that is here. We pray that the, the, there will be a refreshing, there will be love, there will be understanding. We can be able to connect with each other. In the name of Jesus, I speak peace over marriages. I, I speak peace over homes. I, I speak peace over our children. I speak peace over our joy in the name of Jesus. May, may the passion we had at the beginning of this relationship, when we met the first week, we met the affects two weeks, the affects three months in our marriage, that kind of zeal, that kind of passion, that kind of love that we're having for each other may be restored in the name of Jesus. We rebuke every devourer, we rebuke every division, and we speak peace to the homes here in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're watching this broadcast, you don't know Jesus as a Lord and Savior. It's my pleasure to invite you to, the, to our Lord Jesus Christ today to make a connection with him and relate with him and, and make him the Lord of your life. So if you're watching and you don't know him, you can say this after me. Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Amen. If you pray that prayer, it means you're born again, and the Spirit of God will lead you from this day forward. Thank you for being part of this broadcast. We want to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, it's Faithman Teaching on YouTube, and also you can uh, watch me on finishworldtv.com and every day I'm there teaching God's Word and helping people around the world. And today, I want you to align with this ministry as this broadcast can help more people and encourage them to build a strong relationship. And may the blessings of the Lord rest upon you. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Do I have